Hi and welcome to this week's Property Insider video. Today we discuss about Melbourne buyers and sellers being trapped with the extension of the lockdown and Dr Andrew Wilson, apart from giving us the latest property data, shows us where people are buying properties, the top suburbs of purchases for homes and units in the month of August for Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane. Now, if you're interested in keeping up to date with the latest property market data and the latest news on property, please subscribe to this YouTube channel and click the little bell icon to ensure that YouTube updates you each time we bring out a new video. Well, it's spring and this usually heralds the busiest months on the residential property calendar. By now, we'd normally have lots of properties listed for sale. There'd be for sale or auction boards fastened to the picket fences around Australia and a significant pipeline of upcoming auctions, particularly in Melbourne and Sydney, and more properties for sale in other locations around Australia. But what's going to happen this year, particularly in Melbourne, that's going to be locked down for most of spring? That's one of the things I wanted to discuss today with Australia's leading housing economist, Dr. Andrew Wilson, Chief Economist of My Housing Market. And of course, he's going to update us in all the latest market data. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you very much, Michael. Yes, do we say happy spring or we're well, well <laughs> Again, as we've said before, we're not all in the same boat. We're in the same ocean, but some states are doing really well and it's a happy spring for them. But yes, in Melbourne, despite the nicer weather, we are having a difficult time. And I know we're going to discuss that in a moment, but let's start with how we normally do, just talking about what's happened to the markets over the last week, please. Well, it was the spring opener on Saturday, Michael, of course, for the auction markets. And by and large, they were fairly predictable, the results. Sydney's clearance rate at 67%, a little bit lower than the previous two weekends, but certainly a very solid result. And Brisbane, Adelaide and Canberra also continue to produce reasonable results for sellers in terms of clearance rates. Auction volumes also are quite reasonable in those particular capital cities. So yes, as you suggested, some markets are entering spring in the usual rising market environment. The clearance rates a year ago were certainly a lot higher in Melbourne and Sydney. Now, of course, Melbourne is the, I guess, the black sheep of the pack at the moment because of the shutdown. And we're really starting to see that impact the auction market. Just a handful of auctions last weekend, Michael, were listed, around 16 auctions reported listing. That is quite astonishing for the first week in spring for that Melbourne market, which typically is very much focused on auction activity. Auctions typically carry around 35% of all marketing activity in Melbourne. But now, of course, with the banning of open-air auctions and inspections to continue, we're seeing very low numbers of auctions. And that will only diminish, Michael, over coming weekends. We can see the trend clearance rates in Sydney stable in those high 60 percentiles. And that gives a sense also of some of the, reflecting the latest price data, which we discussed last week, of course, which is reasonably steady in that Sydney market. If we continue to see clearance rates pushing up around 70% and higher, it will put upward pressure on prices. And I think also we'll see the same sort of results in the other capital cities if those clearance rates continue. Of course, with Melbourne, it's a different story. But going forward, I think we can look today, Michael, at some of that sales data. And that does reinforce what has occurred during the shutdown period in Melbourne compared to the other capital city markets. So newly reported sales that are tracked on a weekly basis continue to be quite healthy and have risen in terms of the trend in Sydney and Brisbane. Brisbane particularly strong in terms of newly reported sales and Sydney also holding at levels well above the troughs during the downturn. However, Melbourne, of course, no surprise that newly reported sales are now falling quite sharply. And we can see that relationship in the two charts that look at each of the capital cities in terms of where the, each of the capitals have been compared to their base on March the 1st. We can see that Sydney's still below its previous peak, but rising. Melbourne well below. And uh, Brisbane now tracking higher than its previous peak in terms of the number of newly reported sales on a weekly basis. If we compare like with like, Michael, we can see that with Sydney being a 100 base, that Melbourne in terms of comparative volumes is well below 
Sydney and so are Brisbane and the other capitals. So Sydney's still leading the charge in terms of the number of new sales, uh, but Melbourne well below compared to Sydney and falling and will continue to fall going forward. As you say, Melbourne's market is going to go into hibernation probably for another six weeks because we can't have open for inspections, we can't have auctions, agents can't meet potential purchasers or buyers face to face. And that's put many property buyers and sellers into an awkward position. They're trapped. They've been caught short by this extension. The continuation of the ban of being able to go out and look for new properties means that people who've recently sold can't buy new property. People who've recently bought can't sell their property. And we know that buyers are sellers and sellers are buyers. And they've actually made a commitment, a financial commitment, signed a contract to sell or buy. And that's going to potentially lead to some financial consequences and a domino effect because the person who is going to move into their new home, if they can't move out, what's going to happen there? There's going to be quite some issues in the Melbourne market moving forward, Andrew. Yeah, look, that's right, Michael. It's very tough times. And of course, this has a multiplier effect on many industries that are associated with the real estate market. And it's very bleak and probably not that there'd ever be a good time, but this is the peak period of the market. It's certainly going to be on hold for likely the remainder of the year. And all things being equal, fingers crossed that we get a revival in terms of the health constraints next year, then it'll still be well into March or April before we get that level of confidence back into the marketplace. So it really is the prospect of another six months of the very best, moderate, but more likely benign housing market conditions in Melbourne. So even though we open up in late October, early November, it's going to be four to six weeks before auctions can start again, almost getting a little bit late in the year to do that. But it's possible this year, Andrew, that people aren't going to take the break over Christmas, banks, solicitors, estate agents, buyers and sellers. So we may not have the usual break over that four to six week period. Well, I think that's pretty optimistic, Michael. I think people will be... If the borders are opened up, they'll be wanting to get out of Melbourne as fast as possible. Uh, (laughs) And some of them permanently, unfortunately, because there is going to be a financial fallout. Uh, When we made our suggestions of where we saw the property market moving forward in the previous months, I don't think anybody foresaw a second lockdown, one lasting that long, and the fallout effect on small businesses in Melbourne in particular. That's right, Mike. And of course, I think we always did put that disclaimer in that this was dependent on a consistent control of the virus environment. And that, of course, meant the shutdown process. And we've gone back into that now more severely than we had in in April and May in Melbourne. And this is no surprise, the impact that it's had on society and the economy and, you know, sub markets or sub parts of the economy, such as the housing market. And This is going to be a very tough journey going forward for Victorians and Melburnians. There are a lot of vexed issues here. It's just quite remarkable and obviously unprecedented what we are going through now and people will just be hunkering down. And I think the real issue will be what would be the impact once the financial support processes are eased. We do have the banks that are currently providing us a holiday for some mortgage holders have stated that that will end, likely end sooner rather than later. And of course, we have the JobKeeper allowance as well, which is likely to start to moderate. The question is whether that will continue to be directed at higher levels, specifically for Victoria, given obviously they're under more stress compared to others. And there are very many vexed issues here, both in terms of the politics and the economics of the whole support process, Michael. But we've got to really feel, I guess, for those in the housing market, in the real estate industry, who are obviously going to confront something they've never really confronted before. And real estate does work on transactions. You only get your pay once you get your sale. And as we've discussed previously today, sales numbers are really collapsing, not surprisingly, in Melbourne. So that means the income stream is really falling to a trickle and likely to continue over the next few months, Michael. That means that looking at sales figures, looking at asking prices, looking at auction results really doesn't mean much when you don't have statistically significant numbers. 
But I know that you actually have looked at which of the suburbs in in the big capital cities that people are buying in. And now we don't necessarily mean this is a great place to invest or it's the next spot. But I think it's interesting to see where transactions are occurring. So can you walk us through that, please? Look, I track reported sales on a weekly basis. And it's interesting to see using that methodology where the highest numbers on a suburb by suburb basis of reported sales are occurring. The data that we've got today, Michael, takes us from the beginning of August up until the first week of September. What I've looked at there is firstly the Sydney region to both units and houses. Uh, Interesting, no surprise, of course, that most of these high sales areas are in outer suburban uh, locations and are at lower prices uh, compared to the median in each of the capital cities. Some drivers there from the new home and land package from the government, although in Sydney that is uh, quite a modest quantity because there is a definite lack of new house and land packages in Sydney, particularly in terms of affordability. But also we have first home buyers up and about, of course, in New South Wales and Sydney, so they would be looking more at those lower priced outer suburban areas. And of course, when we look at units in Sydney, Michael, it is uh, still quite robust, the unit market. In, in a suburban a beachside a suburbs are still producing reasonable numbers of sales. And I thought it's interesting, Michael, to see that even those areas that we know are that have higher vacancy rates at the moment in a suburban Sydney or in a city Sydney, they're still finding sellers, which is obviously more owner occupier interest than investor interest, given the uh, issues to do with finding a tenant in those areas. But uh, the, the city of Sydney was one of the, in that top 10 for the highest number of sales over that uh, late winter period. Brisbane has been a bit of the star performer, Michael, with sales volumes increasing. What I've done is I've looked both greater Brisbane or southeast Queensland rather than Brisbane itself. And we can see just how strong the Gold Coast is there. And also some of those, we can see Budrum was the top performer there on the Sunshine Coast, but also areas such as Caboolture and North Lakes, which are to the north of Brisbane. Again, those outer suburban areas, urban Gary, that provide more volumes because of lower prices in terms of sales numbers. We look at the Melbourne results. Similarly, Michael, they're outer suburban areas which are providing the most sales with lower prices. But just to take that with a grain of salt, this data starts at in August, at the beginning of August. And I would suggest that when we run the data next month, that those numbers will be significantly lower. There is a lag of a week or more in terms of the difference between when this data is reported versus when the sale actually occurs. Also, interestingly, Michael, in Melbourne, we're still seeing some units sales occurring, even in that CBD area that we know is certainly has a lot of vacancies at the moment, Melbourne 3000 and Melbourne 3004. So uh, maybe we'll get to look at whether these are new or established apartments that are transacting when we look at that, our next series in a month's time. One of the trends I'm noticing is a lot of those sales are happening close to the CBD or in the outer suburbs. And it's not surprising that the more established suburbs where people have had their homes for a long time, many of them have paid off their mortgages, they're just hunkering down, they're sitting comfortably. And that's one of the reasons property values in those suburbs aren't moving, Andrew. That's right, Michael. And when we look at the median, What we will see comparing to more normalised periods is a fall in the headline numbers because we're seeing a higher volume or proportion of lower priced properties in the market rather than those higher priced properties, which, as you said, people are probably in a better position to be able to have a holding position. So that means, obviously, that puts downward pressure on the median with that lower proportion of higher priced properties in the market at the moment. And that's why, look, when we do our listings of asking price data, Michael, we always have that adjusted for composition to take account of the change in the mix of property values from period to period. But nonetheless, it still has a downward impact on the median price. I still think we're looking at around about a 5% fall in the Melbourne median for the year. Perhaps that's the best case scenario, but I still think that on the on the current trend, it's around about 5% down this year. Uh, however, I think that most of the ca- other capitals are likely to actually end the year above the line and Sydney pretty close to it as well. So wait and see on that one, but no doubt that there's a lot more 
hard yards ahead for that Melbourne market and, and not good news that the shutdown in terms of auctions and over for inspections is to continue for at least until the end of October. Well, we'll keep a regular track on that. And I think the point to come from your last bit of this discussion was don't pay too much attention to medians. Yes. You've really got to look at a more granular level yes. because there are multiple markets. There's the inner city yes. market, there's the inner suburban market, yes. the middle ring market, the outer suburbs, yes. new houses, apartments, townhouses, villa units, each of them behaving slightly differently in these interesting times. But you're going to keep us up to date each week with the latest data. Thank you, Andrew. Catch up with you again next week. Thanks, Mark.